understanding has gathered that the market economy, capitalism, is a discovery process. It's inherently epistemological. It's not just the object of philosophical attention. It's, it has its own inherent philosophical activity. I think capitalism and artificial intelligence are the same thing. It's the same process. Capitalism can only be artificial intelligence production, and artificial intelligence can only come out of self-propelling capitalism. You're not understanding either if you don't see that they're ultimately identical. Follow the light. The light is your guide. So accelerationism starts here. What? Well, actually, let's not get ahead of ourselves. A little bit more context. A little bit more context. Well, okay. Whoa, too much context. Let's let's move things forward just a little. Okay, here, stop. Perfect. This should work. So Marx is really the foundational proto-accelerationist. Although obviously Marx is anti-capitalist, he was a staunch utilitarian when it comes to praxis. And if there's any doubt, just read his speech on the question of free trade, where he wrote. In general, the protective system of our day is conservative, while the free trade system is destructive. It breaks up old nationalities and pushes the antagonisms of the proletariat and the bourgeoisie to the extreme point. In a word, the free trade system hastens the social revolution. It is in this revolutionary sense alone, gentlemen, that I vote in favor of free trade. So in contrast to what many people may believe, Marx was not against using capitalism in every aspect. He recognized a very revolutionary potential in exploiting the contradictions in capitalism. For Marx, capitalism can be used so long as it's used as a weapon against capitalism itself. We can also find threads of this self-destructive aspect of capitalism in the Communist Manifesto as well. Marx says, The bourgeoisie, historically, has played a most revolutionary part. The bourgeoisie, wherever it has gotten the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. It has pitilessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors, and has left remaining no other nexus between man and man than naked self-interest, than callous cash payment. In simpler words, the contradictions which will bring the revolution to bear exist within capitalism itself. Capitalism's essential aspects as a mode of production, as Marx put it, bring to the surface a contradiction imminent in capitalist production. It isn't hard to see the accelerationist logic built into this idea. If capitalism contains within it the contradictions which bring capitalism down, then slowing capitalism down doesn't hurt it so much as it actually prevents capitalism from hurting itself. A Marxist accelerationist might suggest that we should speed up capitalist processes in order to hasten their collapse, instead of trying to focus on protectionism both economic and humanist, which would only extend the capitalist process over a longer period of time, thus resulting in a greater net negative. Then we get these guys. Deleuze and Guattari write the Capitalism and Schizophrenia series, taking Marxist materialism and surgically replacing dialectics with psychoanalysis. This Frankenstein's monster of theory becomes influential in many disparate subjects such as anti-psychiatry, art, literature, and eventually this guy. But wait, we'll get there. The key to Deleuze and Guattari in relation to accelerationism is the idea of deterritorialization. Deterritorialization is an extended concept of that destructive element that Marx identified in free trade. The basic idea behind this, and this is where stuff gets really weird, so hold on, the basic idea is that flows of desire are set free by the introduction of things like money and free trade, leading to social destabilization on a far greater scale than Marx actually predicted. This destabilization isn't simply a contradiction within capitalism. Rather, it is some sort of force, an outside force which has functioned to destabilize societies long before capitalism was around. Capitalism is simply the historical stage which thus far releases the most flows of desire and therefore produces the most force, the most social destabilization. 
This force is what Deleuze and Guattari termed deterritorialization. From Anti-Oedipus. Decoded desires and desires for decoding have always existed. History is full of them. Capitalism and its break are defined not solely by decoded flows, but by the generalized decoding of flows. The new massive deterritorialization, the conjunction of deterritorialized flows. So capitalism isn't unique simply because it has the most decoded flows. It is as if society, in a very real sense, has become a decoding machine. Society's decoding machine produces a feedback loop of schizophrenitization, a movement which opens the potential for an attempt at overcoming the barrier of capital itself, not simply to the contradiction and negation of capitalism, but instead to pass over the body without organs into a place of radically creative production, hopefully in the sake of bringing us towards what they called the new earth. Okay, now you may have noticed that none of that made any sense. Don't worry, that's a normal feeling. We need to put ourselves through this. It's important. Let's try one more time. Remember Marx? He had this whole idea of historical progression. Don't worry about this whole thing, though, because Deleuze and Guattari come up with a whole new set of stages. All right, I know this looks like a lot, but really you can ignore most of it for now. All we really need to focus on is that there are stages of history. They're following a line drawn by the process of deterritorialization. In between the stage of capital and the body without organs, we see the schizophrenic as a clinical entity. Uh, these would be like casualties produced by failed attempts at overcoming the barrier of capital. It's important then to note that schizophrenia in a clinical sense and schizophrenitization, what Deleuze and Guattari are trying to talk about, they're not actually the same thing. Don't make the mistake of reading this as a vulgar glorification of schizophrenia. It's actually really not. Another question a lot of people have quite understandably what the hell is a body without organs? Well, it's an egg. But, it's also the remains of a totally deterritorialized socius. A place to act and record yourself upon. Uh, Deleuze uses the term serabat sur, which means literally to fall or fold back upon. And upon this totally deterritorialized socius is the potential for those decoded flows of desire to move in these radically new and creative, unprecedented ways. There is a real potential in this production of deterritorialized flows of desire, of the schizophrenitization of capitalism, a potential to actually, as Deleuze and Guattari put it, overcome a limit, shatter a wall, the capitalist barrier. Hopefully the logic here is pretty clear. The deterritorialization of capitalism isn't something which simply needs to be dealt with. It's something which needs to be worked through. In order to take full advantage of that schizophrenitization of capitalism for our potential escape from the body of capital into the vague, optimistic concept of a new earth. One last passage from Antiodipus to tie it all up in a nice little bow. It should therefore be said that one can never go far enough in the direction of deterritorialization. You haven't seen anything yet. An irreversible process. To a point where the earth becomes so artificial that the movement of deterritorialization creates of necessity, and by itself, a new earth. Whew. Okay, now this is starting to sound like real accelerationism. Hopefully now we have a decent amount of context to get started on the man himself. Nick Land was a professor of philosophy at Warwick University in the 90s when a certain research group, the CCRU, began coagulating around the work of Sadie Plant. Eventually, Plant steps down and Nick Land takes the reins. The drugs in the jungle music really start to infect the assemblage. Soon enough, we get all sorts of weird experiments like collective identities, core topology, snake becoming, and many more. Warwick would vehemently deny any association with the CCRU and actively deny its existence. A common motto became, the CCRU has not, does not, and will never exist. It is during this wild descent into drugs, music, and French philosophy that Nick Land makes his major intellectual turn. Accelerationism. Mm. 
Accelerationism is not the easiest thing to define. Recently Land tweeted that accelerationism means whatever the process makes it mean. Well, that's not a very satisfying answer, is it? In light of this, let's instead try and figure out what the process has made it mean thus far. Well, if we go back to CCRU era Land, where accelerationism was created, there isn't all that much as far as definitions really go. Fang Numina rarely mentions the word acceleration instead focusing on broader notions of cybernetics and the production of non-human intelligences. A quick search of the book shows only one instance of the word acceleration actually written by Nick Land himself. Oh boy, alright, let's get into it. So let's jump a little bit farther forward, see if we can figure out why we don't see the word acceleration a whole lot. This is a passage from Nick Land's A Quick and Dirty Introduction to Accelerationism which is something I hope you've read before you made it here, but if not, go read it. And uh, for those of you who aren't going to read it, here's an excerpt. For accelerationism, the crucial lesson was this. A negative feedback circuit, such as a steam engine, governor, or thermostat, functions to keep some state of a system in the same place. Its product, in the language formulated by French philosophical cyberneticists Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, is territorialization, to capture the contrary trend, characterized by self-reinforcing errancy, flight, or escape, DNG coined the inelegant but influential term deterritorialization. Deterritorialization is the only thing accelerationism has ever really talked about. And this is what we'll use as our skeleton key to explore Fang Numina. Ah, searching deterritorialization returns more than a dozen written instances by land. Hopefully you can see why I put you through all that to lose. Okay, so let's use this skeleton key to start translating. So we have feedback circuits which come in two forms, positive and negative. These are the basic schematics borrowed from a field called cybernetics, which land maps cleanly onto Deleuzian deterritorialization, territorialization, re-territorialization, and further onto accelerationism. So when you hear the words that people meme all the time, cybernetics, deterritorialization, this is what they were referring to, this sort of basic schema of feedback loops. Positive feedback loops, circuits which excite themselves, and negative feedback loops, which either hold the circuit's excitement in place, stasis, or decreases the excitement in the circuit. From Nick Land's Machinic Desire. Capitalism is not a totalitizable system defined by the commodity form as a specifiable mode of production, determinately negated by proletarian class consciousness. It is always on a move towards a terminal non-space, melting the earth onto the body without organs, and generating what is not promised and pre-existing land, but a world created in the process of its tendency, 
It's coming undone. It's deterritorialization. Capital is not an essence, but a tendency, the formula of which is decoding, or market-driven immanentization, progressively subordinating social reproduction to techno-commercial replication. So Land is discounting here the Marxist accounts of capitalism as a fixed mode of production, one negated from within, but instead as something active, something on the move. Towards what? Terminal non-space? The body without organs? Remember, in Antiotopus, we didn't see capital as something headed for something. Sure, it was active, it decoded, it certainly wasn't the fixed Marxist idea of capitalism. But if you remember the chart, the body of capital was something that was supposed to be left behind. It was a stage in the process of deterritorialization, one that provided the potential for our escape, human escape. But wait, human escape? Where is this human in Antiotopus? Antiotopus, intentionally or not, reads as if it was written for the machines, not us. So why did they come to that conclusion that the New Earth was something human, something for us? Why did they come to the conclusion that escape was meant for humanity? Was it just a given that humans are the protagonist in this cosmic story so many billions of years are elder? That humanity was wearing the plot armor all along? This is the transvaluation, the inhuman transvaluation, that really makes Nick Land's work what it is. He was the one to set aside that unfounded assumption and truly continue the Marxist critique, no matter where it leads. Escape? Yes, absolutely. Look at the system. Look at the deterritorialization, the movement, the, the positive feedback, the schizophrenia, the paranoia. So let's ask the hard question then. If the process isn't meant for us, Whose escape are we headed towards? The story goes like this. Earth is captured by a techno-capital singularity as Renaissance rationalization and oceanic navigation lock into commoditization takeoff. Logistically accelerating techno-economic interactivity crumbles social order, an auto-sophisticating machine runaway. As markets learn to manufacture intelligence, politics modernizes, upgrades paranoia, and tries to get a grip. The body count climbs through a series of globe wars. Emergent planetary commercium trashes the Holy Roman Empire, the Napoleonic Continental System, the Second and Third Reich, and the Soviet International, cranking up world disorder through compressing phases. Deregulation and the state arms race each other into cyberspace. Converging upon terrestrial meltdown singularity, phase-out culture accelerates through its digitech-heated adaptive landscape, passing through compression thresholds normed to an intensive logistic curve, 1500, 1756, 1884, 1948, 1880, 1996, 2004, 2008, 2010, 2011, Nothing human makes it out of the near future. Alright, now we get to the real, real meme fodder here. Capitalism is a transcendent AI from somewhere outside of time, working itself into actual form through the positive feedback processes of capitalism. Yes, that is Nick Land's point. Capitalism is AI. If you consider the production of artificial intelligences and capitalism different things, that only means you don't understand either of the concepts well enough. So that's where we are left. Some sort of retro-chronic hyper-intelligent AI has infiltrated or infected mankind somewhere in Europe around 1500, and only now are we in a reflexive position to realize that this thing that we had for a long time thought of as some inert system which we propagated is now something with such a high degree of autonomy and dictation over our society perhaps it's best to start asking the question are we even behind the wheel anymore it's a matter of debate just how much of land's writing was parable how much was metaphorical how much was straight up fiction i personally think with the early stuff it's best to lean towards reading fang numina 100 percent seriously I know, that can be really hard to do sometimes, but I think it's on us to sort of take up that challenge and actually try, best we can, 
to muster an answer to these questions, no matter how bizarre they may seem superficially. The late Mark Fisher put it in no less dramatic terms, Land was our Nietzsche. And if Nietzsche is any sort of model, it is pertinent to note that, more often than not, it was his most provocative and radical statements which echo as the most prescient today. I mean, who could imagine the common man hearing that God was dead? Would he not have reacted in the same way that we do when we hear that Earth is captured by a techno-capital singularity? Perhaps. Land might not agree. I mean, not anymore, at least. He's come down off the drugs and began to suffer from an epoch of deep disillusionment, as he put it stemming from what he called the Facebook era. Before, for example, in the writings of Fang Numina, Land may not have been a card-carrying Marxist or anything, but he was certainly on the side of liberation. There was a certain inescapable feeling of potential, radical new lines of flight, K-tactics, cyber-guerrilla insurgency, effective feminine violence. This was all considered radically leftist political praxis. But Land distanced himself from all of this, he cut as many personal ties as he could to what he referred to as his ancient work, opting that it belongs in the clawed embrace of the undead amphetamine god. He ran his Xenosystems blog for a while, including a very worthwhile rundown on Keck as an archaic chaos god, but it became clear to everyone that Land's thought was swerving quite hard to the right. Eventually, Nick Land finds Moldbug. Is neo-reaction accelerationism? No, not really. Has it become a major source of inspiration and critique for accelerationist theory? Yes, absolutely. So, preempting the complaints, this guy made it in a video essay. Two chief concepts really to take away from this guy and they'll help us continue. First we have the idea of the cathedral. This is probably best understood as the ruling socio-political ideological apparatus. Moldbug put it as the party of the educational organs, at whose head is the press and the universities. This is our 20th century version of the established church. Moldbug also explicitly associates all of this with leftist politics, leading to a new reactionary position, or neo-reactionary position which Nick Land characterizes with flight from the ruling political ideological apparatus, which means in essence, a flight from democracy itself. As Land says, for the hardcore neo-reactionaries, democracy is not merely doomed, it is doom itself. Fleeing it approaches an ultimate imperative. Political alternatives often offered to the cathedral are things like neocameralism, which is a return to some form of market-based nobility, or Second, we have Patchwork, which Moldbug describes as a replacement of crappy governments with a global spiderweb of tens, even hundreds of thousands of sovereign, independent mini-countries, each governed by its own joint stock corporation and without regard to its residents' opinions. Rather than have your right to have your say in government or electing government officials, you instead have the right to choose between a theoretical smorgasbord of political organizations and you can move to any of them rather than vote you leave does this sound incredibly idealistic probably anyways i'm not all that interested in neo reactionary theory i'm interested in accelerationism so that's all you're gonna get here go watch the distributus for more if this sounds like your kind of thing his rundown on mold bug is much better than anything i can give you <laughs> So Nick Land runs into this idea of neo-reactionary theory, and he runs hard with it. He goes full reactionary, old wig, starts in with some strangely pessimistic, dysgenic IQ shredder stuff, and finally took up his new philosophical mantle, the Twitter shitpost. Now, Nick doesn't blog like he used to. But aside from his Twitter feed, he has begun publishing chapters of his book on Bitcoin and one of his other blogs, Urban Futures. Overall, his shift has been away from the overtly occult angle towards a more universal idea of intelligence production, something he feels it should be mankind's duty to foster. Basically, he's disappointed humanity hasn't gotten its shit together in order to bring the damn future into existence. It's important to clarify exactly what intelligence means in the concept of accelerationism, because 
as Land puts it, intelligence explosion is the name for the thing that accelerationism is looking at. So for Land, intelligence is the ability to win games. That's about it. He thinks that the basic schema of intelligence can be diagrammed through game theory. The more intelligent a thing, the better it operates, the better it is at winning games. Operation and intelligence correlate. There's a meme I sometimes see out there that capital is sentient, which it's actually a meme. Land never said that as far as I know. Sentience is the ability to feel, to perceive, to experience. Land doesn't actually think the measure of intelligence, artificial or not, is determined by feeling. That's consciousness. Land wants to talk about artificial intelligence, not artificial consciousness. This is another challenging conclusion of his anti-anthropocentrism. We smuggle in the assumption that in order to be truly intelligent, you need to be truly conscious. But why do we make that assumption? Are we assuming all intelligence in the universe must feel in the same way that we do? And if we take away this assumed subjectivity, call it acephalic AI or something, it's not absurd to see how markets manufacture this sort of intelligence. The very nature of capitalism's ability to operate through even the most severe crises is all the evidence you need. Remember game theory? Capitalism will always win the game, even when we change the rules. You know, uh, the problem is that from the very beginning of capitalism, people had this hope, you know, oh, it's approaching its end, let's push it a little bit further. And I found this quite comical, like Marx described capitalism, and for Marx, capitalism was close to its end, approaching disintegration. Then Lenin said, okay, now imperialism, the last stage. Then, half a century later, Mao Zedong says this uh, post-World War II imperialism, it's imperialism, capitalism in its highest, last rotting state, and so on. Then with postmodernism, this new cultural, you mean, like for over one century, this story goes on. We think capitalism is pushed to its limit, but it, it's like an undead vampire or whatever. It returns stronger and stronger. So in Youngland, we mostly get a descriptive account of accelerationism. Most of the praxis comes in the form of critique, not positive political formations. In Old Land, however, we have a tendency towards seeing accelerationism as needing our help in some way, as if accelerationism needs a bootstrapping of right-wing political praxis in order to help it achieve its goals. This is what we will call in the rundown RAC, or right accelerationism. This is a form of accelerationist praxis that wants to see capital take over, but only in a particular way. It could perhaps be called protective accelerationism, as it wishes to act as a bulwark in order to protect capital against its potential enemies and see it flourish, so to speak. Land's analysis of IQ shredders, for instance, is an example of this. It is as if capital must be making a mistake, or it has been bested or duped by humanity. Either way, we must step in to help it. The all-powerful AI from the future is coming, but only if us meatbags can happen to find the right immigration policy. I guess I don't really sympathize with this because capital is supposed to be numinal, you know? It's supposed to be outside of human phenomena. It's supposed to be the damn elder god, not me. This is from Pete Wolfendale's blog, Deontologistics, from an article titled, So, Accelerationism, what's all that about? Right accelerationism has converged with neo-reaction precisely because it identifies the deterritorializing force with capitalism itself. It sees itself as biting the bullet, and claiming that if we want to accept the liberating alienation of capitalism, we also need to accept an inevitable return to the familiar, feudal structures it has fleetingly displaced. Congratulations to anyone still with me, you have all made it past the hard part. Hopefully this has given you a pretty good idea of what land is about, but contrary to what some people might actually think, there is more to accelerationism than just Nick Land, so we must continue the process. Let's explore a few more branches of accelerationism. You've all heard of ARAC because I just told you about it, but you may have also heard stuff like LAC, UAC, ZAC, GAC, etc. None of this is settled. Everyone in the field seems to disagree on everything in accelerationism, but this is my little survey of what's gone on so far. LAC, or left accelerationism, is the attempt to overcome capitalism through its deterritorialization. 
Because the process of schizophrenitization, or whatever you decide to call it, Land sometimes calls it the motor of modernity, it is something outside of capitalism which we are as yet unaware of. Left accelerationism agrees with Land, but is interested in bringing back more of that human liberation stuff that got left behind with Deleuze and Guattari. Put another way, left accelerationism begins from the premise that the deterritorializing force is not capitalism itself, but that the transition from feudalism to capitalism was an expression of an emancipatory drive that capitalism's re-territorializing dynamics has systematically, but never wholly, suppressed. Ziak, or Zero Accelerationism, is a philosophy of stagnation. It sees the proper praxis to accelerationism as seeking some sort of political stasis, or trying to stop the ferris wheel at the top of the ride. Ziak is based on the proposition that we're not going to accelerate, not the process of deterritorializing capital. We're not going to accelerate actual progress, overcoming capital, utopian dreams, nothing. We're going to accelerate absolutely nothing. GIAC is, uh, wait a minute. First, xenofeminism is a movement which looks to technology as a radical potential for lines of flight for feminism. They draw on the work of people like Shalimuth Firestone, who proposed a certain potential for liberation in the automation of the birthing process. The idea being that you could radically flatten the biological differences between man and woman. No longer would women be deemed the bearers of children simply because of biology. This echoes through Sadie Plant, the inaugural head of the CCRU, when she writes the infinitely influential zeros and ones. Xenofeminism neatly ties the anti-naturalism of acceleration into radical feminist theory, positioning to link techno-scientific innovation with collective theoretical and political thinking in which women, queers, and the gender non-conforming play an unparalleled role. GIAC is gender accelerationism, which is some crazy open source castration magic. It's like xenofeminism's occult sister or something, seeing not a line of flight for gender, but rather gender itself as a line of flight for capital. Nix, the author of the Gender Accelerationist Black Paper, describes it as the process of accelerating gender to its ultimate conclusions. Capitalism and its coupling with cybernetics, or techno-capital, wields gender and picks it up where human evolution leaves off. The central figure in GIAC is the trans woman. In this castration, in this mutation into the acephalus, she becomes the body without sex organs, the body in a virtual state, ready to plug its desire into techno-capital becoming fused with techno-capital as a molecular cyborg who is made flesh by the pharmaceutical medical industry. UAC is unconditional accelerationism. This is basically something like accelerationism no matter what. Where most of the other forms of blank AC are defined by their positive political praxis, UAC is defined by the negation of positive political praxis. UAC simply asks for the recognition that the frameworks for action are not dictated by us, but rather by the process itself. As Edmund Berger put it, one could go as far to say that UAC rejects praxis, even that it is anti-praxis, yet at the same time, this is not so straightforward. If we step back and take praxis in its most broad sense, the higher form of acting in the world, then UAC is hardly anti-praxis. It simply asks that the limits and the inevitable dissolution of things be acknowledged. There is no contradiction between posing this alongside the xenofeminist mantra, if nature is unjust, change nature. There are also a few accelerationist adjacent thinkers, like Ray Brassier, a student of land influential in the school of philosophy known as speculative realism. Probably best known for his work Neil Unbound, he is critical of philosophy's tendency towards meaning, a staving off of the perceived threat of nihilism around us. Instead, Brassier is interested in something like accelerating nihilism to its ultimate conclusions. Mark Fisher was another student of land, deeply influential in the LAC movement, although always in an insightfully critical fashion. He explored the idea of cancelled futures, a certain stagnation of cultural capital, which at one point was accelerating at a feverish pace, and has now seemed to fall strictly into the repetition of nostalgia and parody. He does all this through his reimagining of the Derridean concept of ontology and some other interesting projects. He also offers a very valuable critique of Land's interpretation of Deleuze. This is from Terminator vs. Avatar. 
land collapses capitalism into what Deleuze and Guattari call schizophrenia, thus losing their most crucial insight into the way that capitalism operates via simultaneous processes of deterritorialization and compensatory re-territorialization. Capital's human face is not something that can be eventually set aside, an optional component or sheath cocoon which with it can ultimately dispense. Reza Negrestani is... Um, uh, oil is the excrement of the sentient Middle East, or... Okay. So we've got a big map, a big map of... A big map of intelligence and spirit here, actually. Uh... The non-conceptual representational mapping. The sound NS is mapped onto the automatons to... Oh, NS is statistically correlated with a pattern governed regularity of EI. Something about holes, po uh, politics... Uh... Corresponds to Kant's threefold synthesis. Synthesis and reproduction in the imagination, and synthesis of recognition in the concept. Uh... And that's my quick rundown on accelerationism. If I'm wrong or I missed anything or you have any questions, whatever, just leave a comment. I'll leave you with a short FAQ at the end with some questions some people might have kicking around in their brains at the end of our little project. Don't accelerationists just want to make everything worse? Don't they just want to collapse everything? So hopefully by this point it's obvious that accelerationism is a very broad subject. But none of the ideas we have seen so far have been along the lines of make everything worse. Yes, classic Marxist accelerationist praxis involves using what it considered unjust, i.e. capitalism, in order to antagonize social relations. But it wasn't in the name of making things worse. Even Marx's attempts to collapse capitalism were done to make things better, at least in the attempt to. And the real answer is that accelerationism doesn't really say anything about what we should do. It's more of a descriptive claim, first and foremost, about what's happening. The forces of modernity, their circuitry, ideas about what to do about these things. As we have seen, not only are they diverse among the accelerationist community, a lot of them are contradictory. What does hyperstition, teleoplexy, k-pulp, etc. actually mean? If googling doesn't get what you want here, I mean, it's all out there, but the accessibility of some of accelerationist writing can be less than inviting. Just leave a comment, I'll try to get around to doing a video on that specific concept or work or whatever you're having trouble with. Why does this sound different than all the memes I read? Well, it turns out there are much more people making accelerationist memes than there are reading accelerationist theory. Even some of the people who apparently are into accelerationism, some of the things I hear them say just baffle me. <laughs> like, you've never read Nick Land to say capitalism is sentient or capital is sentient. It's just, it's, it's not a position that accelerationist theory holds, although some of the people online calling themselves accelerationists tend to say it. I still don't understand any of this. Well, no one said this would be easy. I don't think anyone understands accelerationism in the acute sense so much as it is something like a collective decentralized research program scrambling desperately to define itself. We all get to take part in that scrambling though, so that's kind of fun. I'll leave a few more introductory materials in the description alongside the bibliography of all the source I referenced. There should be more than enough reading in there for you to keep yourself busy if you're still interested in this stuff, that's for sure. Well, anyone who made it to the end here, thank you very much for joining me on this journey down the accelerationist rabbit hole. If anyone has any questions, feel free to leave them down below. I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thanks again, and I hope you all have a speedy day.